So we had a gate, just didn't have anything in the gate. So my men are picking up anything that was loose, barrels, and wood, and chunks of lumber, and we piled up and we improvised this gate, and the shells started to fly. Folks, I'm sure you've been down there in the coast when it's in the heat of the summer. It's not comfortable to begin with, let alone inside a fort with large cannonballs are flying all over the place. My company was held in reserve. We stayed inside the fort with Mary and the rest of the men around the ramparts of the fort, firing off gun guns at a slow, easy pace. Oh, we figure that during the siege, General Lee wants to come out and inspect the fort. And wow, well, we were a little busy at the time, but the general said to come out, so my company was assigned the task of tearing down that improvised barricade to allow him inside. So under fire, my men went out there and pulled down that barricade. In the process, two of my men were wounded. Uh, Mr. Sam Gale and Sergeant Young, but we opened the door, General Lee came in and said, what a fine job we were doing. And it was fine enough that the British turned around, they went home. Now I'm sure you all heard the tale from Weems how Marion fired the last shot from the fort that passed through the rear of the ship and took the pants off the Admiral. Far from the truth. I believe in Lieutenant Schubert, the final man who shot. I don't think he actually passed through the rear of the ship and decided to fall about that big and not pass through somebody and just remove the pants that usually the leg and the rest of the body is going with it. But by the end of September, we were a full Continental Regiment. Two finest colors were then to us. Now we're ready to serve and do our duty for the colonies. I got promoted. So now I'm not just a captain anymore. I'm a major. Which really means I get to do more staff work. And so they didn't really tell me that part either with the congratulations, now you're promoted. You're now a member of the staff. Now I get to sit on things like parole boards and court marshals and be officer of the day and everything else. But we were still preparing our army to get ready for eventually when we went to go after the bridge. General Lincoln decided that we had to do something about Savannah. And now that we had the French allies and we're going to do something about them, I got lucky again. I got promoted to Kenker. Now I have my own regiment to give me command of the 5th. So as one combined force up in the French, we marched south to Savannah. And folks, I'll tell you plain, I have never seen a more backwards, organized siege ever conducted on a military operation. The French want to do it by the old European style, negotiate, talking to the British, comparing orders. And we're sitting there watching the defenses just get thicker, deeper, heavier. They only had one French engineer with him who knew what he was doing. Unfortunately, he got killed halfway through the siege. So now other guys are out there trying to build these batteries. The artillery was not even hitting the target. Some of them were rocking their, their rounds on top of their own guys. And then the batteries themselves fell apart because they weren't well made. So Lincoln decided that we're going to take Savannah by infantry force. My column went around the far left. They told me, don't worry, the guy knows what he's doing. He's from there. I don't know where he's been, but about we got so deep in that swamp, we couldn't find one way out or the other. And then, of course, we're trying to a surprise attack so that we'd have the, at least that element to our you know, benefit. And some French company decided that they were in the wrong position. They were the more senior one and should be on the right side of the column. So with vice playing and drums banging, they walked across the whole front to take up their proper position. Uh, I think the British knew we were coming. When we finally broke out of the swamp, front, you know, the sun was up, they could see it, but we shouldered our muskets and we charged towards that Spring Hill Redoubt. My men did well. I could see my old colors, the second south, going over the top there, planting in that redoubt. Through the little bit I could see from the smoke and the carnage. As the men were just being shot to pieces. One color cropped, and then the second color. We couldn't hold it anymore. We couldn't punch through. We lost a lot of men that day. I'm sitting there watching these crumbled bodies out on this field, and this was so much a mistake. My men had to pay that price. Next day, when I'm on roll call, they were trying to find out how many men I had left. One in five weren't answering their name anymore. So it was a Slovan army that we marched back to Charleston. My unit was so decimated that they took my regiment, combined it with the first. I'm out of a job. Not much I can do except provide some staff assistance in the city. But without a job aside, you know, see Emma Charlton, perhaps I should just go home, rest, and recuperate a little bit. 
while I was at home, I realized the word got to me that the city had actually fallen. And I was riding down there, and people were trying to tell me, you better not go. The British have it now. The word did get to me that some escaped, to include my friend Francis Marion. Broke the bank somehow. But he was being moved from house to house. Cornwallis decided he's going to solidify his command in the south. He started sending out these columns of troops to 96, Camden. We got old bloody band himself coming down to Georgetown to secure that area to make sure there's not nothing was left. There wasn't very many. We went underground, hiding in the swamps, moving at night. We were able to find where Marion was and we linked up with him. Word finally got down to us, the hero himself, the savior of Saratoga, was marching south with a new army. He was coming down to free us from this oppressor of Cornwallis. So being the good officers that we were, we rode north to meet up with this new army. By the time we got there, and we linked up on the August, I have to say we were about a sorry sight to see. Trying to live in the swamps, live off the land, moving at night, even this best of clothes doesn't survive the uh, biggest thing I always remembered about was wet. Always, always wet. I could never dry off because I could never really dig up my clothes and dry because at any moment we could be hit by Tarleton or any other patrols. The clothes just rotted off us. When we rode in the gates of camp, there was only about 20 of us left. Mostly young men, black and white. The only thing on us that didn't rot off, our helmets. The rest of us, some were naked, some were in tatters. You guys have a whole new version of being saddle sore after a long day of riding up north. <laughs> but when we got there, Gates didn't know what to do with us because we didn't look like continental officers anymore. We looked like a bunch of ragamuffins coming out of the swamps. Which we were, a bunch of ragged men coming out of the swamps. <clears throat> so he didn't know what to do with us. Well, down in the Georgetown region, the British had took it. Major John James started organizing the resistance because Tarleton was running loose and he's starting to burn the houses. So he was able to organize four companies of militia ready to go. But he wasn't very experienced as a leader. So he sent a message up the gates because I need an officer down in this region who understands how to conduct warfare who's experienced. But for gates, this was a win-win situation. I'm supporting James and I'm getting rid of this ragged buffalo of Mary and his men. Because we were, we could walk around the camp, we could see these continentals laughing at us because you know, we were rather threadbare and things were hanging out that shouldn't be hanging out. <laughs> things were pretty rough. So Gates assigns Marion, you will go down to the Williamsburg district and you will take charge. You will spread the word. And I am coming south to liberate them from the British oppressors. Marion took his orders like a good officer. We assembled what little supplies we could. We rode off. We arrived in the Williamsburg district. We, Marion really didn't have the authority to take charge of the militia. But he did anyways, because he's that type of person. Those, not only those four companies came to our, to our rally to our call, but other men who knew Marion, who had served with us before in the second start, to rally to our call. And that's when we got the word that the hero of Saratoga got crushed at Camden by Colonel Wallace. Of course, I have to say, it was impressive that a man of his stature and age could ride from Camden to North Carolina for three days. That's pretty good for a man uh, like that. So we knew now we were it. We had to do something about Cornwallis and his men. So we learned from a deserter that a column of prisoners were being marched to Charleston. So we got on our horses. We met him at Nelson's Ferry. Gave him what for? Not only did we free those prisoners, we captured about 23 of them. Unfortunately, because of our ragged state, the thing allowed them to turn prisoners to the boy, the war must be going really bad, and this is what they're sending down to rescue us. By the time we got back to friendly control, all but three had deserted us. The fact that we did this under the British nose didn't sit well, and they decided to send Major James Weems and his 63rd into Georgetown make sure that we wouldn't do it again. We knew they were coming, we just weren't too sure how big they were. So we sent Major James to go out there and take a look at this British force, and he came back on They're big. There's a lot more of them than us. So we erred on the side of caution, we got on our horses, and we left. We rode to Amy's Mill across North Carolina, and Browning Creek, waiting time out. So we picked the right time to hit the enemy. 
is while we're up there, we hear about a man named Major Ganey, Captain Beresford, running around with her loyalists, terrorizing the area in the Cherau district, presenting anyone who come up support us. And what was really bad about that? Both of them were members of the Second South. Major Ganey somehow felt himself slighted by some officer when everything ended in Charleston, he took King Schilling just like that. That's not good, but it was Beresford that really got me underneath my skin. He had been in the walls with us at Fort Sullivan. He suffered under the same conditions, the same heat, the same shot and shell that we all did. And then he took the King Schilling at the end of Char I mean, Charleston Bell, formed a mounted loyalist unit. So we decided to go visit our old former ranger mates and introduce ourselves. We rode out of North Carolina, and we met them at Blue Savannah, and we broke them up and chased them into the woods, let them know that nothing's so easy being on the loyal side. Of course, we did that. I didn't sit well with the British, and here we went some more. We could ride down there at our own convenience, hit the enemy, and win. So we released Major Venus. He decided to, to place the whole Williamsburg district to the torch. Fifty plantations are burned. Several men are hung. He even went around and destroyed the mills, the looms. He shot the milk cows. He bandied the sheep. And he even went so far as to burn the Presbyterian church at Indian Head. Because he said, hm, it's just nothing but a shop of sedition. Wow, well, talk about some terrorists. Now we took that personal. You know, regular war we understood, you know, line of truth and old linear type. When you start coming down and burning homes, terrorizing good people, we take that rather personal. If you're going to play that way, so will we. We'll do terrorism with terrorism. But one thing it did was it did drive a lot of men to our ranks. People were sitting on that fence, didn't really want to fight for the British, and didn't really want to fight against the British. Now they had to make up their minds. They may have to choose a side now. They did it. How they may lose a house. So it did help us recruiting. We got more men to join our ranks. Later on, we were chasing after another former member of the South Carolina militia. His name was Major Harris. He had formed the South Carolina Rangers. Walt Charleston, he also decided to take the King's show. But as we're going down there, we learned of Colonel Times. You know, it seemed like everywhere we go, the loyalists were just coming out in droves. Especially with new equipment, new muskets. So we found out where Colonel Time was camped <clears throat> down at Tiro Swamp. Bad position though when we finally found him. The swamp was to his rear. He's in a fork of the river, big open field. Big bonfires inside. The men were just lounging around, singing, sleeping, playing cards. They had no idea we were there watching. Baron decided to form us up in three columns. We waited about midnight. Mary fires off his pistols, and in we came around, whooping and hollering. We killed six, captured 14, and took over 80 stands of arms, new blankets, new saddles, new equipment that we can use. But back then, that's the only way we we're going to get resupply. You can only get so much from the local populace without them having unnecessary attention drawn to them by the Tories who burned their houses. We had to recover anything we could from the battlefield. So we thanked them immensely. Especially, we didn't suffer a single loss in the swamp. A lot of them boys said, you know, perhaps we need to change sides. A lot of us joined us right on the spot. So the change in name to that battle <coughs> turned to the swamp. We brought them over to our sides. It was very effective for us. Now they sent Tarleton down to try to take care of us. Well, didn't do too good. At least he couldn't ever lure us into an ambush. But he burned 30 more houses, still terrorized the populace. Kind of helped us because now he's getting more people to help support us with food, some shelter, and now and then with some men power. <clears throat> Mary must have thought that time for me to move up in the world. He gave me my own independent command to operate by myself and my own. We want to take Georgetown. But before we could take the city, we knew that we needed to get supplies. Need boats, need cattle, and stuff like that. They said my column go down to White Plantation. And get close to us in the dark, we come riding up. Unfortunately, Ganey's men was already there ahead of us. The troop under Captain Lewis was there, already terrorizing the area and taking the cows. So we came in and we chased them all off. 
So I'm sitting there watching what's going on with a young lad named Gwen, while my men are searching through the airboys of Spaghetti or Lewis's men. Ten mounted soldiers come walking up towards us in the dark. I didn't know who they were. So I yell out, friends? And they replied, friends, friends of the king. <laughs> Ooh, we knew I was in trouble then. And Gwen didn't even hesitate. He lowered his musket and let him have the point blank range. He killed Lewis right on the spot. Except when Lewis fell, he shot my horse. Now he died, I'm on the ground. But luckily with the shooting going on, my men came out of the woods, chased them off. And were able to get out of there and head back home. It was later on that we got back home, we found out what happened to Gabriel Mary. He had been one of the other patrols. He had been unhorsed, brutally beaten, and murdered. Shot so close that his shirt caught on fire by an escaped slave named Sweet. But one of our men found him. Summer executed him on the sock, put a pistol in his head and shot him. So Mary pulled us all up, and he explained to us, the gentlemen, we will fight this war in a proper military manner. We will follow the regulations established on us because if we don't, we are no better than them bandits and ruffians out there terrorizing the neighborhood. I don't care if it was my nephew who was killed. We will still perform our duties as officers of the South Carolina line. Under that, we will behave ourselves and we will follow according to our regulations. Colonel Tynes once more appears. Now this one. Now, after we hit him at Tearcoat Swamp, he was actually arrested later on. He was taken to North Carolina, which Mary was doing. Anyone we captured, he'd send to North Carolina. But I tried to explain to him that North Carolina seems to do this catch and release program. A lot of their sheriffs are loyalists. We catch them, and they release them. And that's what happened to Colonel Tynes. He got loose, and he was trying to reorganize his force near the political Fort Upton. So I was told to take my troop. We're going to ride up there and confirm What's he doing? So we got up and we started riding up along the Black River. We came to a cavern that's owned by a known loyalist. I was going to question him to confirm the information on Tynes and Fort Upton. Well, I must have intimidated the husband because he started talking like that. I must not have really intimidated his wife at all. Because she was kind enough to go out back and show my men where the apple brandy was hidden. Little did I realize that my men were partaking of said spirits were loading up their canteens and drinking as much as they could as fast as they could. Because after I got done talking with them, I came outside and I realized that my men were being goofy. <laughs> they were smiling like baboons, talking like magpies, and with the greatest spirit I've ever seen, <laughs> literally. My whole troop was drunk. There was no way I could finish my mission now, so I decided that we have to go back to, back to our base camp. So as we're riding all the way back down the Black River, my men are doing nothing but hooping and hollering and carrying on. Terrorized the whole neighborhood. The word got back to Tynes and his men. Twenty of them deserted on the spot, thinking that we were terrorizing their homes. I may not have been able to find out about Colonel Tynes. My drunk men terrorized him so much, he lost his command. Tynes realized how small his militia was quit himself, resigned his commission, never fight again. Talk about chance working on your side and problems smiling down. But I didn't really finish my mission because I couldn't find them. But the way my men acted was enough. Terrorized them so bad we had a strategic victory. We took out Colonel Tynes a whole militia of just scaring them to death. Now it says another, Major Singleton. Says he's going to try to take care of Mary. He marches into King Street, sets up his camp, and just dares Mary to come out of the woods and face him man to man in the field. We knew better. There's no way we could face the regulars on open fields. We left him alone for a couple days. And I guess he got a little nervous. He decided to head home. Three weeks later, though, we find out he's coming back. He was carrying about 200 fresh recruits from the 7th Fusiliers from Charleston up to Camden. We'll pick the place in time of our attack. So we decided to pay him a visit along the road. We caught him good. I came up with my man and hit him in the rear. Just kept punching their pickets, driving them forward while Marion went around and ambushed him from the flank. And we pushed him into an open field that was surrounded by a fence. We backed off into the swamp. We're going to fight our war our way. 
And there's no way we're going to let open field until we beat them toe to toe. But Murray brought up the right one, told them, start engaging the pickets. And they did. They did a great job of it, too. Enough so that we saw a white flag appear. An officer comes walking out. So we walk up to talk to him. And he goes, how dare you shoot at our pickets? That is unconscious against all good judgment of law warfare. Marin looked at him like it's no different than you coming around our homes and burning to the ground. As long as the British continue to burn our homes, we will continue to shoot your pickets. So he challenges Marin on the spot. Man to man combat. We'll pick 20, you pick 20. We'll meet in this field we'll decide this in a proper linear European fashion. Marin accepted and sends out 20 of our best. They start marching across that open field. We can see the British on the other side, and they're 21. They just stood there. I mean, got closer, got closer. The British turned around, walked away. Hey, anytime you own the field, that's a victory in my book. He turned around and came back. We continue to watch what they were doing. We see the campfires. We didn't realize he pulled our own trick on us. He built big bonfires, ran away in the night. It was the only time I've ever seen Francis outfoxed by a British officer. Now we knew the game was on. So I sent down to Georgetown, because that's still our major concern. We want to take the city of Georgetown. We weren't too sure on the defenses. So I was told to go down, set up an ambush, see if I can get some information. And, um, I'm a little nervous about ambushes. I don't know if you know about this, but I have a bad tendency to stutter. Kind of like buck fever. I'm so excited, I can't say the right word. It happened before. We were in a nice ambush position. Here they come. They were approaching. Shoot! They're going to shoot you, my friend. Say. So my men knew what to do, but not necessarily everybody else. I wasn't too sure how to do these ambushes. So we went to Georgetown. I set my ambush. A couple Queens Rangers come walking up, but in them they had two civilian women. So I decided I'm not going to spring the ambush, I just want to let them walk by. Well, no luck. So I decided I'm going to take my men over to the White Plantation. We hadn't eaten for three days. We get there, we were really well received. Normally she's been very, very supportive. So when I go in the house, there's those two young ladies sitting in their parlor. And she's making it, you know, she's literally fighting me. Like, why am I, should I help you, you ruffians and everything else? This is not normal. So we moved into the kitchen so these young ladies couldn't hear us. And she whispered to me, they're Tories. You have to act like you're stealing my food because I don't want them to think I'm supporting you because they'll come back and they'll burn my house. So we made a big production of it. Of, you must give me your food or we'll run you off. It was at that time, my men gave us a signal that the rangers were coming, so we got out of the house, we mounted our horses, and we met a pet on in one more charge. Drove them away. We took two prisoners. Trying to find out the former members of the 3rd South Carolina. They had been in the prison halls down in Charleston. Decided the best way to escape to join the loyalists, get out into the countryside. So we welcomed them with open arms into our regiment. And we went back to our base camps. Well, then we went down to White Monnet, still trying to get boats, trying to get supplies. One thing about rural warfare is you have to accept whomever you get sometimes to help you out. Let me talk to you about one of my subordinates named Captain Clark. How can I put this together? Captain Clark's a simpleton. He doesn't have a lick of common sense to save his life. But he was an officer, he was brave, just sometimes just not very swift. I sent him forward as we went into the West Monarch area, and he captures a, a former slave and lets him go. The slave runs back to Queens Rangers and tells them exactly where we're at. I did not know this. I was swept through the area, I was getting ready to set my camp for the night, so I put Clark and his men on picket duty to make sure they were not surprised. Of course, the Rangers are alerted, so they get out their horns. And they're calling the alert. Clark tells his men to stop and listen, or a hunt is about to come through. That was a hunt, all right, for him. They caught him by surprise. He was able to, he was able to fight and escape and get out of there. 
There was enough commotion that we ever get our men together. We come riding up, we charge forward, and as we got close, all our men lowered their muskets and fired. Swan shot. And that's all we had left back then. We didn't have a lot of ammunition. We didn't have a ball or a buckshot. Had we had good shot, I think we would have caused more damage. Swan shot, uh, kind of stung him. The problem was, my horse threw me. I fell to the ground. I'll let you another one of those little secrets. You know, I, I am a kind of cavalry commander. I can't ride a horse. Even though I'm a land gentry and I had, I had all this land, I never really learned to ride a horse well. I can sit on it, I can get around, but sometimes in the heat of the action, I fell down a lot. So now I'm laying on the ground, and the Queen's Rangers are charging up, and one sees me and he draws back his sword. And if you ever noticed, they were the same helmets we did. He thought I was one of them. Saved my life as he rode away. Well, we're able to get ourselves together, we pull off, we, we occupy an abandoned redoubt, thinking that they may chase us back to our camp. And we sit there for a couple days. They don't come. So we decide to run back to our camp, moving along the river, and a low hanging branch knocks me off my horse. This is my other secret comes out. I don't know how to swim. So my men had to come rescue me out of the river and get me back on a horse and get me back to my camp. So I'm glad to say I had a real good rapport built with my men. Rather than had a problem recruiting soldiers out there during the days. But well, we sent back in, we decided that uh, life was through, he came, came down, and with Lee's men and our men, maybe we could take Georgetown now. Well planned out, night movement, came in by boats, we came around on horses, we rode into Georgetown, and we caught Colonel Campbell himself. And he surprised us that after he, we captured him, no one tried to come rescue him. In fact, they boarded up in this brick house and wouldn't come out. It's literally that we realized that the morale was so bad in, in Georgetown, they were in a mutiny. The fact that we captured Campbell was a great asset to them. They wouldn't come out of their, their house. We had nothing that on us to breach the house, so we had to pull off with Colonel Campbell as prisoner. Unfortunately, we helped the British out more than they did than we did, and then they replaced him with a better commander than what we had before. On February, Orders were issued that each regiment will form its own light horse troop. And Marion picked me. And I looked at him and said, Marion, you do realize I don't do well with horses. I mean, I can ride, but I don't ride well. But it's better to have an officer you can trust, able to do independent command, than necessarily ride on a horse. So I have my own regiment of horse now, all four his regiment, four troops. We had to go up and down to do the swamp. Now they really sent an aggressive commander against us, Colonel Watson. Now originally, Watson was going after Sumter. Sumter found us out, grabbed his family, and got out of there. So Lord Robin told him, well, if you can't give me Sumter, give me Marion. We find out about this. So we set up this nice ambush for him. We had our infantry out, we had the riflemen ready to go, except for my horses. We couldn't really find a place to hide the horses. Now Watson was experienced enough to realize that to fight a guerrilla war, he couldn't just rush into things. And that's what he did. He sent his scouts forward first. And as they come riding up, he sees me and my horsemen. So they come charging forward. And I see him coming. I look back to my men and get caught up with buck fever once again. I couldn't get the word out of my mouth, I grab my sword, pull it up, go! Follow me, you know what I want you to do, and off I would start riding forward. So the men for really wanted to charge at that time, they came right up behind me, we beat them head on at that point. One of these days I'll figure out how to fix that buck favor. It's always when it comes to that point, but you say fire or charge, I just get caught up and start stuttering, so let my men do what I want, what I meant, and we charge into them, and we drove them back. So we started to chase after Colonel Watson. Kept him on the run. But while we're chasing after him, that word got to us that Green had defeated Cornwallis and killed him. 
We go down the Lower River Black, uh, Black River, the Lower Bridge. Marion sets up his riflemen. We have to stop Watson getting across these uh, rivers and deeper in the country. So they pull up the flanks. Here comes Watson. He tried to force the ford. The riflemen wouldn't let him do it. They start picking off his men. It was so effective that they brought up their cannon and they shot at the riflemen. The riflemen start to pick off the cannoneers. So Watson pulled off. He went to the Witherspoon Plantation for a little bit, and then from there he went to Blakely. And we just kept surrounding him. And we kept shooting him. So he hides. He said, This is not good enough. In the middle of the night, he literally drowns his dead in the river so he couldn't see their numbers. Packs up everything, takes off. Marin sent me down to the San Bay Bridge. I need to stop him from getting down to the south. So, hey, the rifle <coughs> went before on the black. Why not do it down here? So I bring up my lieutenant to get his rifle in. They're on the fort, and they're ready to go. Watson just forms his men to a huge column, glistening bayonets, and they just charge right through the fort. My rifleman saw him turned around and ran away. They were very experienced. They had not dealt with a bayonet charge from the British, especially in a column. So they ran away. So we had to remount our horses. We charged after them. But I did catch up to the supply column, though, and I did they hit them in the rear. But we didn't block them from getting across the Sand Pat Bridge. So now, now we started to realize that the only people really we had a threat after these days just these little outposts. So we started going around. So we went to Fort Mock. Started to lay siege. My cavalry troops were riding around, trying to prevent any supplies coming in and coming out, but we didn't have any cannon. And we realized we had a problem. So this young cavalry officer just got attached to his name, Mayhem, came up with an idea of building a town. Someone with no engineering, that was a great idea. It worked. But once more, because our riflemen were picking off the officers and picking off the pickets, the commander of Fort Mock comes out and challenges once more that you're nothing but banditti's and murderers. Why can't you stand up toe to toe with us? We're not going to fall for that one again. We kept it up to enough that Fort Mock surrendered for Watt too. Then we moved down to Fort Mock. Now we had cannon. But we had some problem with Green's instructions. He was sending orders to us. And of course, Light Harris, Larry uh, Lee came down, and Mary could see how well equipped they were, how the discipline was. And then he looked at us and our rags, what little clothes, the younger, you know, some of them were not as disciplined as these. And, you know, he, I guess he was feeling the pinch of trying to do this in the world war. But then we also got word that they wanted our horses that we were to give up our horses and give them to Green and his continentals. And that didn't sit well with any of our men. Whether it was true or not, we don't know. When the sun came up the next day, all but 100 of our men deserted and gone home. We were able to take Fort Mott. And Green himself came down and personally met with Marion. And they finally figured out that communication problem between the commander and Marion. They were able to work it out that it was the mistaken communication that they were not going to take our horses. Well, Green needed Marion's help. His next objective was to try to go take 96. He's going to need Marion and his men. But we also just took Georgetown. So Marion came up to me and he asked me, would I mind being the commandant of Georgetown? Hmm, let me think about this. Sitting in a swamp, sitting in a house, Carried off by bugs, sleeping in a house. I readily accepted the command of Georgetown. At least there, I could at least be almost decent again, meet with my family, and get the city back up and running. While he was off taking care of 96, word got to us that Danny has had a change of heart. He didn't want to fight no more. He wanted to negotiate a truce. So I was given the responsibility to meet with Ganey we worked out a truth. He doesn't attack us. We don't attack him. We all signed it, and they went away. Now this is great. Cornwallis is no longer down in colonies. We're taking up all these British forts, and their major loyalist problem, again, he's gone. 
So all my militia guys went, woohoo! I'm going home. I had to start recruiting all over again because most of my men decided that they're, they're done. The booty's done. The British are gone. Life is good. So now I had to start recruiting men all over again and going through the training and the equipment and getting them back out because we had a viable force once more. I guess we broke one for Colonel Watson. He didn't want to fight no more. So they bring in Colonel Stewart to take over his command. Stewart moves to Orangeburg. He starts to get surrounded. Stewart realizes I have to get out of here. So he gets on his horse and he rides. Except this time, he used similar tactics as we used. Not like Watson tried to everything conventionally. He got off the roads, rode along the trails, and we missed them. When we finally realized that he had passed us, Baron ordered myself and my, my troop to go after him. And they were well ahead of us. When I did catch up to his rear of his column, I was able to take some of his supplies. But that's the first time I've actually seen a British commander use our own tactics against us effectively. Green was concerned about the operations in the South. So we started calling it the Raid of the Dog Days because it was just so hot. And the only way you could move effectively then was horseback. So Sumter took command of all the partisans under one force. Our orders was to harass the British all the way to the gates of Charleston. So each of us got our assignments, and Marion, we were assigned to go after Monk's Corner, Colonel Coates. Monk's Corner is pretty much the biggest church in the redoubt, and eight companies of British infantry. That's going to be a hard nut to crack. That's our assignment. But as we're going down, Mayhem, who was set up on his own activity, needed help. So myself and Lacey we were sent to reinforce Mayhem while Mary went on to, to go up the coast. We're down to biggest church. Once more, another freed slave pinpoints our location, goes back, tells Coach exactly where we are, so he sends Fraser and his dragoons to come after us. It was cold, it was wet, it was raining, and I had a patrol out. They run right into Fraser's troop. And the men were up muskets to go snap. Because it was so wet, none of the flints worked. They overran our position. They took the prisoners back. The coach says, that's not what I want. I want them all. Go back there and get the whole camp. So they rode in, and they caught us at dinner time. I had pickets out. At least I thought I had pickets out. I thought we had enough early morning. It wasn't enough, so Fraser came through our camp. We were scrambling to get on our mounts, refight off the attack, and break away. What we didn't realize is this was nothing but buying time for Coach. He was down at Biggin's church taking all his supplies and throwing them in the church. And he set it on fire and started to run away. To Sumter, that was a starting gun, because he saw the fire in Biggin's church and knew that he was on the run. We had to hit him fast. So we got all our mounted troops together, and off we went, chasing after Colonel Coates. We did have artillery. Some were told them to catch up when you can. We're not going to wait for you. We chased him down across the Quimby Bridge to a place called Schubert's Plantation. That same Lieutenant Schubert I told you about who fired that last shot, he's home. Except Lieutenant Schubert is now a prisoner somewhere down in the prison hall. Coates was smart. He knew that he was facing mounted troops, so he took his infantry and formed a giant square, anchored the corner with the buildings of the houses, and put his artillery in the center. The rest of it was open field. We came up and we looked at and Sumter decided we are going to attack now. Marion protested. That's open field. They're already in the square. We can't break it. We need to wait for the artillery. Sumter disagreed. And as a senior officer, he ordered us forward. And under protest, we did. And we got chewed up horribly. Many of our men got shot down. We would lose 50 men charging that square across that open ground. We fought as long as we could until we ran out of ammunition. But we were broken. As I'm standing in the fight, the bullets are whizzing by me. One of my lieutenants right next to me gets hit. And he tells me, I told him to stand his ground. <laughs> He's hit again. I said, do the best you can, but you will not abandon your post. He's hit a third time, then a fourth. He dies at my feet. 
Sometimes following regulations needs to be done, and sometimes I think you need to bend the rules a little. Perhaps I should have told him to fall back to another position or else maybe he'd be left alive.